Okay, well, we might as well get, we might as well get started thanks to our talk, um, which is Improving the Open Source Security of a Large Open Source Project One Step at a Time. Uh, Raphael and then myself are both from the Node Project, so we're going to be sharing our experience about what we did in Node. Uh, so first, a little bit about myself. I'm the Node.js lead for Red Hat and IBM. That means I get to spend a lot of time in the Node community. I'm on the technical steering committee, active in many of the working groups and teams. Um, I'm also involved in the OpenJS Foundation, and I also get to work with a lot of great teams within Red Hat and IBM who are deploying Node at scale, helping our customers do those deployments, or working on tools to make it easier to deploy your applications to things like OpenShift. So, over to Raphael. Right, okay. Hello, folks. Um, I'm Staff Engineer at Senior Forum. My name is Rafael Gonzaga. Uh, I'm from Brazil, so long, long flight, long journey. Uh, I'm also a Node.js Technical Steering Committee member. Uh, so, well, if you don't like Node.js, partially, it's our fault. So, if uh, I'm also a Node.js releaser, so if any of the Node.js builds breaks you, it's also our fault. Uh, and, well, we run the Node.js Security uh, Working Group meetings, and uh, uh, I'm a Node.js Working Group lead or chair in that meetings. So, well, I have some social media, so if you scan this QR code, you'll be able to follow me. So please do it. It helps a lot. I'm trying to do more content on Twitch, so it's more live. Uh, let's see if that works. Uh, well, that's it. Okay, so before we get started, I'm going to give you a little bit of an idea of what we're going to dive into. Um, we're going to start out with a little bit of background about the Node.js project, some OSS funding that we've gotten that's really helped us. We'll then jump into sharing our experience and we'll share our experience in sort of two ways. One is like the reactive part of the process. So when we get vulnerabilities reported to us, what do we do? But then also the proactive part of the process. What is our security working group doing to look proactively in terms of improving the, the security across the project? What kind of initiatives should we have and so forth? And then finally, we'll sort of dive into if you have any, if, if hopefully we've piqued your interest in getting involved and helping out, what are some of the ways that you might do that? So, how many people know uh, the Node.js project? See, there's a good number, but still a little bit of an intro is worthwhile for, the, for other people. It's, it's an open, open source project uh, that was coined by one of the, the original collaborators, Rod Vag. And what that means is there's no one company who's really backing a good, por you know, a, a large portion of the collaborators. It's individual contributors, uh, people from companies, but everybody has sort of their own goals and, um, things that they work on. Uh, so it's very much you know, organic in terms of what takes place, which has some good things and some bad things, as you'll see, in terms of what's working and what's not working for us. It's widely used. There was over a billion downloads from Node.js.org just in the last year. Um, and that doesn't count downloads through things like Docker and, and other places. It was at the top of the OpenSSF criticality list, which is one of the reasons we, we've got funding and probably why we're talking a little bit about it here. I do want to say that security's always been top of mind. Uh, the, the people who put in the original infrastructure were always thinking about that. We have like a separate release infrastructure just dedicated to do releases. Um, you know, we think about like who we give access machines and stuff like that. So it, it's always been sort of something that we've been thinking of. But as I said, because we're an open, open source project and a lot of people are volunteers and, and sort of volunteering to work on different pieces, that's not always a great match for time critical work. If you have something which has to happen by a certain date, a certain time, that's not something volunteers are a good match for. They're great for like, hey, here's a problem. I'll get to it when I have time in my spare time. Security work is often the more like we want to do it faster. There's some expectation that that happens. So I do want to say a big thanks to the funding we got from the OSSF. Uh, that started in 2022. It's continuing in 2023. And the key thing I really want to highlight is it doesn't enable just the work for the person that's funded to do that work. Um, they have enabled our security team and more people in the project to actually do work across a number of areas, much more than any one person could have, could have been doing. So there's that, that really good multiplier, and that's one of the key things of getting somebody into the project who's basically their job to worry about security and to help move security forward. That doesn't, that gets you that multiplying factor. And without that, it's really hard to have, uh, to make pro progress as a project because everybody is willing to do some bits and pieces, but with nobody pulling it together, it doesn't work quite as well. So we'll start out with a look of like the reactive things because they're sort of the reactive and proactive side of things. And we're going to share 
what we tried, what worked, what didn't work, that kind of stuff. So the first thing is uh, we'll, we'll talk about the, the life of a security vulnerability in terms of like looking at it with our threat model, uh, getting reports, creating fixes, and actually doing security releases. So without a threat model, some of the discussions on vulnerabilities reported often felt a little bit like this. Um, often it's a communication challenge um, where you know, people who, who are reporting the vulnerabilities have invested quite a bit of effort. They may have a very strong opinion that this is something that the project needs to fix. On the flip side, the, you know, the, the project has uh, as, a, as a view of what they consider a vulnerability or not. And before we had the threat model, it might have been hard to figure out what that was though. So that could lead to some friction in terms of like, well, why are you telling me this after I put all this work already in? So the threat model really helps um, for us to have those kinds of discussions. And so this is, is an example. I just want to ask everybody and say like, okay, here we are, we're requiring FS and we read, we're asked to read a really big file and node falls over. How many people would put their hand up and say that's actually a vulnerability in Node.js? So I see one, and, I, and every time we've done this, we've gotten a number of people. And this is, this is sort of the, the extreme case. There's subtler cases of this. Um, and within our threat model, the answer is no. Um, we trust the code that you ask us to run. So therefore, if you ask us to read some huge file, we just did what you asked. Um, and the, the, you know, the other cases which we've had in real life are, are, are subtler, but it's sort of, you know, the, the threat model helps to kind of put the bounds on, on those kinds of things. So what's in the threat model? So the first thing it starts out with is like, what do we trust? So there's certain things that we trust. We trust the code that you ask us to run. We trust the environment that you're running the, 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 the node application in. So for example, the file system, if there's files on that system already, we trust that you've configured it properly. Um, what we don't trust is, say, a remote, end, a remote uh, client making a request to a, one of our local HTTP servers, right? Because that's outside of the control of the person who's running Node. And so if that remote server can connect to Node and do something unexpected, we would consider that uh, um, a vulnerability because we don't, we don't trust them. We've published it in the security.md file, so anybody can read that. It was a recent addition uh, from you know, one of the initiatives of the security team. And I'll say it's hard to define, and it's probably still a work in progress. Uh, we wrote down what, you know, our best attempt at sort of capturing what we think is and isn't a vulnerability. Every time we receive a new vulnerability, we'll take a look at it in that context, and we may either extend or modify the model to reflect, you know, what we think makes sense. Because sometimes we may look at something and say, oh, maybe the, the threat model doesn't quite say the right thing on that front because this should be a vulnerability or it shouldn't. We also always re reserve the right to treat something as a vulnerability, even if the threat model says maybe it's not, right? Like we may say, oh yeah, but that's important enough, say to the overall ecosystem that we will decide we're gonna make some change and we're gonna keep that uh, you know, private until we've released that change. Um, so now that you know a little bit about the threat model, we'll look at our, how we you know, reactively handle reports. The first thing is please don't open public reports. I'm probably most nobody in, in the room who's would, that, would do that who's here. But that's our first message is don't, don't open them in public because that causes us a lot of headaches. Um, we, have, we use HackerOne, which is a tool that lets you submit in, in private. Uh, we can then review. One of the really nice things though is at the end, we can also make all of the discussion public because the project really does have a strong emphasis on doing everything transparently and in the public. Um, with security vulnerabilities, of course, we don't want to do, make things public until we've released the fix. But HackerOne is a tool that lets us sort of get the best of, of both of those. So people will report to HackerOne. That goes in and you can go to the Node.js project on HackerOne. There's a nice submit button. That ends up in the inbox uh, of the project. And so now we have a list of things that people have reported. Once it's been reported, we will uh, have people do initial triage. And we, like I said before, we look at our threat model. And we'll either say, yep, yeah, we believe that that's a, a, a vulnerability based on the model, or we'll say, sorry, we don't think that is. You know, it's okay to publish that publicly because, you know, it's, it's not something that's security related. Um, once we've uh, accepted it, then we need to do a CV, CVSS calculation. This can also be hard as well because I find no matter, almost 90% of the time, it forces it to be like high, turn on the alarm bells, 
the, the, the challenge I have with that is that costs the ecosystem quite a lot of money. Uh, you know, companies have policies that say, like, if it's a rated high, it must be remediated within two days or, you know, so the high ratings have an actual impact. So it, my, my sort of take, take away on this and suggestion to everybody is like, really think about it when you're doing your CVSS score and, and try and make it reflect how important or how urgent you really think it is, because that's going to have a follow on effect to lots of people. Um, in terms of what did and didn't work, um, we started off just trying to handle these through email. So we asked people to report vulnerabilities through email. That's not very easy. It's hard to manage. It's hard to follow up. And then it's hard to like, hey, we had a report before that seems similar. So that wasn't too great. Um, even once we moved to, to Hacker, when we tried ad hoc triage. So basically, eh, we've got 20 people on the technical steering committee. Everybody will take a look sometime and figure it out. That unfortunately didn't work very well. We would either have nobody doing the triage or one, yeah, usually it ended up being like one person who started to do it and then felt overly compelled to continue doing it because nobody else did and then they got burnt out. So that really didn't work well, as, work well either. Even scaling that up to like a small number of triagers. So for example, you know, in our team at Red Hat, I tried to get one of our team members who was part of their, their regular role was to like help with the triage. But because it was a small group, and because of the, the, the previous picture of cats, it's not always the favorite, you know, the, the most fun conversations that you're having, um, they also got burnt out. So even if you're like a fully paid person and it's kind of part of your job, it still burns people out after a while. So really you need a larger number of triagers so that you only have to do it every so often. Um, the other thing that we're still challenged with, I think, is handling features that are experimental. And I'm still not sure we've quite landed on exactly what we want to do. You know, experimental features are things that are flagged as experimental, so it's kind of like use at your own risk. Um, but if there's a vulnerability in one of those, we still acknowledge that they can affect people who are using it. So it's not like we should say, no, they're not a vulnerability. And, and so today we treat them like any other vulnerability, but back to that causing the alarm drill for everybody in the community, that can cause a lot of, of, of churn and cost to people who aren't even using these features. So we're still trying to work through like what makes the most sense on, the, on that front. What is working? A triage team greater than three people. I think we have four or five people on the triage team, five. So it means like once every five weeks, uh, we have somebody on rotation for, for that two, for two weeks at a time where they don't necessarily have to figure it all out, but they're the first like, hello, thank you very much for your report. We'll be looking into this. They may find the right person to do the triage or they may do the triage themselves. So that, that really works better. Both the part about having a rotation so that you know you only have to do it that one out of five weeks and it's not gonna fall all into your shoulders and having enough people to sort of spread it out so that by the time you're, you're getting annoyed, you're, you're, it's on to the next person. Um, and HackerOne, as I mentioned, you know, I, I think that's working well for us because it's a private place to report, but we can make it public afterwards, uh, which is important to the project. It also gives us the easy CVE assignment. We did act as our own CNA uh, to issue CVEs for a while, but the management of requesting those and doing that manually, that this actually made it much easier. So we sort of defaulted to just using it through, through HackerOne because it was easy. Um, so security reports, uh, handling those. So now we've got the security report. Now we've got to actually do some fixes. Um, so in this case, you know, we've started, we've got our accepted thing. Um, now we move over to our node uh, private repo. So we have, in addition to the public node uh, GitHub repos, we have a private repo so that we can actually have people submit a PR and run tests. Unfortunately, the, the project, I shouldn't say unfortunately, but the project has a very broad set of supported platforms and architectures. Um, and we, we consider that if we run a test fix through our CI, we've effectively disclosed the vulnerability. So we, we avoid doing that. Um, but what that does mean is that in our node private, we do some testing through GitHub Actions, but it's a very small subset of the tests that we would run before we did a release. Um, so I, you know, you can see like, I don't know if there's, maybe there's ARM in GitHub Actions, but there's lots of platforms which aren't in OS combinations and stuff like that. So we'll, we'll have people submit their fixes in the private repo, we can have reviews, and we can get to the point where like, okay, we're now ready to do the releases. In terms of what's working and not working, people availability was always a challenge because often the, the um, vulnerabilities are in a particular area and there's only a smaller number of maintainers who are 
um, you know, up to speed in that area, and we get cases where it's like, yeah, I can do that fix, but I can't get to it for a month. And then similarly, you know, we had some reports where it's like, okay, you've got a 90-day deadline, and so that's where, again, like your volunteers and trying to do something within a certain time frame can be a challenge. The other one is we've got lots of maintainers who really know Node, but some of these vulnerabilities end up being very specific to the OS or the architecture, mostly the OS, I guess. So like, for example, Windows, um, if we, we've had a number of things on the Windows platform where we're like, eh, would I call this a vulnerability? I don't know. Let's get in a window. Can we get, find somebody who we can sort of get like a Microsoft opinion? And we found that to be quite challenging. So that's something that's still a bit hard is to like, how do we get the platform OS expertise when we need it to make those calls? Um, it's also harder to work in private. Again, as I mentioned, the limited CI testing. So you can get your thing tested, but then find out at the day we're doing the, the release that it doesn't actually pass all of the CI. It's much harder to pull in people because it's in private. In public, you know, one of the advantages that we have with open source is that we can say to a broad number of people, please take a look, give us your feedback and get reviews and stuff like that. And then finally, to get that testing at the end before we do the release, the last few times I think it's been something like a week we've locked down the CI, which affects all of the regular work. Um, and so, you know, those, these are some of the, the, the sort of challenges in our creating fixes side of things. Looking at security releases, once we decide that we've got all the fixes we need, we've got actually a very well-documented 26 security release process. We built this up over time. Um, so we didn't want to, we didn't say, hey, let's create a whole bunch of steps that we need to do and work for people to do. Um, but these are things that like people would ask along the way, hey, you did a security release. Could you have given me a notification or heads up at, ahead of time? We would integrate that in or could you have done this and that? So it, it ends up being a lot of work to coordinate across all the collaborators who may have done the different fixes, giving advance notice to the ecosystem, advance notice just to internal teams. We may need to say to our build team, can you help lock and unlock the CI? Um, to the uh, Docker team to say, hey, you, you probably want to pu publish new Docker images this date and so forth. Um, it's harder to, you know, it talks about the, the, sorry, part of the process is also like pulling together information, like providing an explanation of what those vulnerabilities are and what you see in the CVE reports as well as our, our blog posts that go out. Those take actually quite a bit of work and then actually doing things like locking and unlocking the C CI. One thing that uh, I guess you'll see on the next thing what I say is working is we now have what we call release stewards. So actually do our so security stewards, actually doing a release, the release work itself is enough work that we don't want to add those 26 steps to the same person who's actually building and put publishing the releases. So we have a release steward who works with the releasers to you know, put together those, those summaries of the blog posts that are going to go out, coordinate with all the different teams, do the notifications, uh, published to the, the NodeSec mailing list that the release is coming up and, you know, heard the many things that have to take place. Um, and many thanks to the companies that we have uh, on the list. We really asked in this case that these be people that were not just individually volunteering, but whose company has said to them, yes, you can prioritize this over other work. And we think that's important because, again, this is something time critical. Um, and as an individual, somebody may say, yeah, I'd like to volunteer, but then it's kind of unfair to them almost to expect them to jump in and do something like this. Um, I'd love us to build this list. You don't see as many big companies on there as, as you'd like, um, but at least it's a start. And again, having a rotation of people who do that is, is a good thing. So over to the proactive side of things. Right. So um, I'm going to talk about how the things that we did on the security team that was more proactive. Um, well, one thing that uh, I would like to mention briefly is the history of the of the group and before and recent success and initially uh, the current initiatives and how you can help actually. Well, the security working group basically is now called security team, but uh, we are formed by a bunch of companies, a bunch of uh, people that are volunteering their times to to, to work on the security part of Node.js. So we have meetings every two weeks and uh, we also have some initiatives, some ideas that if you want to, to, to have to, to, to give an idea or if you just want to complain about something in the secret space of Node.js, you can join and we'll answer you, I guess. Um, 
Well, we have also the Node.js secret project uh, vulnerable to database that uh, whenever we release a secret patch, we include to that JSON, to that long JSON, which CV we have fixed in the Node.js part. And well, the primary focus is obviously on the Node.js side, but we have a bunch of projects in the Node.js project like Undici and others that we, we contribute to. Well, uh, first of all, I will talk about the recent success and uh, we have talked about the, the threat model, so I will just skip that part and I will go straight forward to the dependence vulnerability checks. Uh, well, let's say that we are using, uh, you are using Node.js. Node.js contains tons of dependencies. Uh, we use Zlib, we use OpenSSL, we have some dependencies. What if one of those dependencies release a secret patch? How will you know if that's affect Node.js or not? Usually, in the past, we receive an email or someone ping us, okay, this affect Node.js, we don't know, they open an issue, but we are more reactive in that part. And the idea of this initiative is to be more proactive in that part. We have a repository called Node.js Dependence Vulnerability Assessment. It's pretty large, I know, uh, but it works. So whenever you go to that repository and go to the issues, we have an automation check that runs every week and check for open uh, public CVs in uh, one of our dependencies that affects Node.js. So basically, in this example, we have Zlib. Uh, and then it opens an issue and we, as a TSC or other Node.js contributors, go to that issue and say, okay, it doesn't affect Node.js. We don't use that function or it, it, uh, we believe that it affects Node.js. So that's the primary point if you, if you are running your scanner and your scanner is sh uh, are showing, okay, Node.js is vulnerable to OpenSSL 3. You might want to go to that repository and check, okay? Yeah, and of course, this is just for things that are public, right? Yeah. So if you find something new, don't report it here, but if you find something that's publicly reported already has a CVE, you can open an issue here to ask. Yes, exactly, thank you. Uh, well, the next one is one feature called permission model. Uh, well, uh, it was included in the Node.js 20. Who saw Node.js 20? Raise the hand. Okay, just five, three, okay, that's fine. So I will talk about this new version of Node.js that will become uh, current, uh, will become LTS in a moment. Uh, basically, let's, let, let's uh, assume that you are trying to solve a problem using Node.js and you are round, uh, following a random tutorial on the internet, on the website, as usual, uh, or one of your developers in your team are following it. And it saw in a blog post or YouTube that magic package will be the magic package for you and they will install it and solve your problem. However, the problem is that sometimes the package might uh, return the expected result for you, but it can do things uh, behind the scene that you were not aware. For instance, whenever you install a package in Node.js, this package will have the same permission as uh, your main process. So if you are running it as a root user, the a package will have root user access when you are installing it. So in that case, spe uh, specifically, whenever we call magic function, it will try to read a file, in that case, an example of a sensitive file uh, in the Linux machines, and, uh, but it will return the expected result. So basically, as a developer, you will never know that's happening behind the scenes, unless you have some checks, right? So that's the idea of the permission model. Whenever we run permission model, basically dash dash experimental permission, it will restrict access to the file system. Uh, let me show you. Yes, it will restrict access to the file system to create worker threads. Well, you can create threads on Node.js. You can create child process on Node.js, uh, and it will also restrict access to the inspect inspector protocol or use native add-ons on Node.js. How it works is pretty simple. For instance and passing the experimental permission flag. We need that flag because this is an experimental feature. We are developing it. So that was not meant for production, uh, not yet. So, well, whenever you pass that flag, you can also pass, okay, I, I want to allow access to this path specifically of my project. So it will, uh, whenever you try to run or call that package, it will throw the following error code 
access denied, which resource it was trying to read, and which permission was denied. So basically, you are now safe at some point. Okay, so that's the main goal of the permission model. So this exists on OJS20, so if you want to check, I really I recommend. Okay, so as I said, we have several flags, you can check it, you can uh, uh, restrict access specifically to write access or just read only, and that's up to you, okay? Uh, we also have a runtime API. If you want to create a an, an, uh, an package on top of it, you can, okay? Well, the next one, the next feature or uh, recent success was the security best practice document, okay? So, well, there is uh, uh, this QR code, if you scan, you go to the Node.js blog website, basically is the, the document I will talk about. Everything started when we tried to create the, the threat model, but in the middle of the process, we decide, okay, that's, that's, up, that's normally, uh, we are targeting secret uh, researchers, but what about Node.js developers or Node.js users? In, uh, how can, can, can they understand what can be a, a vulnerability or not? So we, we created that project, that document called Node.js Security Best Practice Document. It's available in the Node.js uh, org. So basically, it will tell you that just because things are not threats, threats specifically, it doesn't mean that you can ignore them. For instance, you are creating a net server on Node.js, but you are not handling errors, which means that if someone sends a message that will turn in an error in, a, in your application, it will uh, crash your application causing a DOS attack. That's not a Node.js vulnerability, but it's up to you as a developer to handle it better, okay? So uh, in that document, you will be able to see other uh, checks and an example of a DOS attack or any other attack, for instance, in this case, there is a slow lawyer's attack that uh, is, is quite common in, in that space. Also, we talk about uh, how we mitigate prototype pollution and, well, uh, there, there are a lot of uh, mitigations and other specific threats in, in, in the Node.js space that you must be aware of, okay? Well, next one. Automation of the dependency updates. Uh, as I said, Node.js contains uh, several dependencies. Uh, you can see all the list here that's up to date. Uh, we have Undici, we have libuv, V8, Zlib, a bunch of them. Uh, every day, I assume, one of those dependencies releases a patch. So we need to be up to date with that. What happens in the past, like someone go to the project, update the library, and then make a pull request. That's a manual work, that's time consuming, and frequently we stay uh, out of date. The idea of this automation is pretty simple. Let's automate everything. Whenever one of those packages release uh, a new, new version, we have a bot that will combine, will create the, the, the patch and create a request on the Node.js. Uh, you may think that, okay, the Pandabot could handle it, but it's slightly different when you deal with the dependency in Node.js because we build everything in the single binary. It's not technically a NPM dependence that you can just use and uh, a renovate bot or depend a bot. So that's working pretty well, thanks to Marco. And well, uh, the next one is, well, uh, we will talk about the OpenSSF scorecard, CIA best practice, some process that we are using to measure uh, the security of the Node.js project, okay? So, uh, well, first one, OSSF scorecard. Basically, the OSSF scorecard is a way to measure the score of your application based on, uh, on several uh, uh, feedbacks or several uh, workflows, and it runs uh, dynamically. So you get a score based on a specific parts, for instance, branch protection, you get a score out of 10. So, uh, it helps you identify some issues that, like, good first issues. Uh, oh, in, in that case, specifically, we have created that initiative on the Node.js project. And uh, every single day, I receive a message from someone, okay, I want to contribute to Node.js, but I don't know how. It's so complex. It's a complex uh, data uh, source code. And I said, well, go to the working groups. They are cool. 
And that was uh, one of the examples. We created one task like, let's pin dependence by commit hash. That is one of the, the requests from the OSSF scorecard. And uh, someone raised his first pull request and was very happy, posted on LinkedIn, oh, I did my first pull request on OJS, and that's pretty cool because that's easy and it's very helpful to the project. In that specific case, basically, what we did is, do you know when you use GitHub Actions? When you use GitHub Actions, you normally tag the version uh, in the, for instance, Actions Checkout. You have the version 4. Instead of using version 4, which is mutable, we are using the commit hash, which is technically uh, in immutable. So, in that case, this is one of the things that increased the score in the OSSF scorecard. Uh, currently, Node.js is 7.3 of 10. Uh, we don't know exactly how far can we reach because uh, there are some rules that are not applicable to Node.js. We have a different workflow, so uh, we are still figuring it out. And well, let's move forward. This is the CIA best practice. This is also a set of workflows, a set of checkpoints that we do on, on the Node.js project to guarantee that we are following the best practice of the, Node, of the, of the security standards. Uh, and wherever time you go, you normally receive a badge. You start from the, the bronze, I guess, and yeah. then, yeah, then you go to the silver, and <coughs> finally you get the, the gold badge. Uh, basically, the badge doesn't mean a lot, like you can lie if you want. Uh, the, the main point here is to go direct, to document all the process and see if you are really following the rules, following the standards, if you are really securing your project. That's very good. Okay, Michael uh, told you that, well, we have 26 steps. Now imagine that we have 26 steps but we need a security release steward. And we have usually three active release lines. So we have 26 release steps for each active release line. So multiply it by three, plus the steps from security release steward, which is a lot. Usually it's one week of time consuming to release a security patch on OJS. It's very uh, time consuming, it's painful. So the idea of these initiatives, okay, let's have two buttons, one for normal release and one for uh, secret release. Whenever we need a secret release, just click this button, we will automate everything, we will release, we will distribute all the package, all the binary across the board, and that will work. That's still a work in progress, and that's quite important because once we release uh, secret patches often and quickly, we are uh, reducing the attack vector of a bunch of attacks, right? Okay, that's the easy button I meant. Uh, well, uh, we have some next initiatives, so maybe uh, Michael wants to talk about uh, the, the review of the build process uh, and uh, uh, how we can guarantee the reliability of the resource. Sure, so Marco did some great work, so we now have scripts that automate the uh, dependency updates, so we have a pretty good understanding of what that update process is. Um, so looking at it from the supply chain security side, that, that's good. Um, the next thing we're doing though is we're saying, okay, these dependencies, they may actually have their own build steps or transformational steps themselves. Um, a good example is we actually bundle in some WASM binaries within Node.js. And so to take the source that we build them from and build the WASM that actually gets pulled in and built in during the node release, that requires some tools, that requires an environment. And so this audit is to look at each of the, the dependencies and say, well, do we understand that fully what environments needed, what tools, what versions of the tools? And that'll help us also be able to say like, okay, if there's a vulnerability in reporting one of those tools, maybe we need to go and do something. As well as if we have to do a security release for one of our oldest release lines, we can actually build, rebuild the same thing without finding out that like the new version of the tool doesn't compile or causes some other problems. So that's a, a sort of a, a follow-on directly from now that we've automated the dependencies. Next is to make sure that we fully understand any steps from the source that it takes to get to what we actually pull in. Okay, so basically, uh, how you can help? Uh, normally, uh, uh, it normally takes a balance of both with, as an individual and as an organization. Uh, I will talk about how individuals can help and Michael will talk about how organizations can help. 
I will go uh, bottom to top. So number six is basically you can help by contributing to the security issues. We have not only private issues that is normally vulnerabilities that we work on. We have a bunch of security issues uh, or uh, when I mean security issues like uh, new features or things that is, we, we, are, we need to research to include on OJS, we need to remove or something like that. So as an individual, would be great if you take a good first issue. And then, well, you can volunteer as a security subject matter expert, which means that, okay, I'm very good on security. And I would like to give that power I have to, to help assessing Node.js vulnerability, uh, to help uh, addressing or implementing the, the, the new design of the permission model or new features of Node.js. So that would be great. Okay. Or for example, if you're a security, uh, a Windows security expert. Exactly. Back to the oh, that would be awesome, definitely. If you are expert on Windows 2012 server, Air 2, we are looking for you, okay? Uh, so we can also j join the security team group. As I said, we have meetings every other week. That's open for the public. So please join. You can also watch on YouTube. It's, uh, it's live on YouTube. Uh, and if you want, just scan this QR code and that would be great. Third, champion a security working group initiatives. Uh, what is a security working group initiative? Basically, permission model was one of them. Automation of the dependencies was one of them. So if you see something that would be great, uh, a good initiative, actually, a big initiative for the Nudge project group, come to the meeting and say, okay, I would like to, to champion it. So that would be great. And then volunteer as a release steward. As I said, security release, security triage are very painful, time consuming. And once we have more people helping, uh, that pain reduces a lot. <laughs> okay, and the first one, well, that's of course, uh, be a Node.js core contributor. I say that, well, it is not difficult to be a Node.js co a core contributor. You just need to have time. You just need to, to, to work on that. Like, we have a bunch of easy issues. We had some issues are not uh, so hard as you may think. Uh, you can also ask uh, to all the Node.js group. Uh, we are very helpful on that. So we have a Slack channel on OpenJS Foundation. So if you join that, and we have also a channel uh, ask anything, so you can definitely ask anything there, okay? Oh, by the way, we have a Grace Hopper Day in two days. So it's Friday, yeah. So if you want to, uh, to, to know how it works, you do a workshop and how you can contribute to Node.js. Okay. So of course, it's great if individuals decide to contribute and help out with the security, but really, I think that businesses and organizations that are using Node are the biggest beneficiaries or, you know, actually have the biggest stake in terms of making sure Node's secure. So what are the top five, I guess this time, ways that like organizations can help? Well, the, the sort of lowest level is, you know, if you, if you I, we talk to companies and some of them are like, we can't actually send our people to contribute, but we have some money. So you could contribute to the Node.js LFX Bug Bounty Security Fund. Um, and that's, that's a fund where we're actually getting some money from our hack from HackerOne as they, they, they currently have bounties which they pay people who report vulnerabilities. But in trying to help people who have to fix them, they're actually contributing some money to the projects as well. So we're starting to build up a bit of a fund that we'll likely use to try and get some security vulnerabilities or find some volunteers to, uh, or paid, vol paid volunteers to do some work. The next one is join a foundation that supports Node.js. As, as, as we mentioned, you know, we're really grateful for the support from OSSF. So if you join one of these foundations um, and encourage them to actually support development or, or at least security work within projects, that would be a, a good way to help. Next is implement vulnerability reporting procedures that are friendly to open source projects. A lot of the vulnerability reporting procedures, at least in my mind, were, were built with product paid companies in mind and, and in, intending to kind of force them to spend their money to prioritize this work. In an open source project, nobody's getting paid. So like, and there's nobody like, I can't tell somebody, hey, you go fix this, right? So I'd ask that you implement your vulnerability reporting policies in a manner that's compatible with open source because it's, I think it's different. 
the next one is to report people for being a security point of contact or for you know helping to lead some of the strategic initiatives. So it's, it's one thing for a company to let their people do some work, sort of on their own time for their own benefit. And it's another thing to say, this is strategic to our business. And you know, if you do this work and, and you do it well, we're gonna reward you for that. So that's the next step is sort of like, let them do that kind of work. And then the really highest one would be to have them, you know, reward your people for stepping in and helping with the triage, the fixing, um, and basically the, the security vulnerability handling process, because like I said, it's something where volunteers, the more volunteers we have, it makes it a bit easier, um, but actually really supporting your people to come and do that kind of work is probably the top thing that you can do to help. So that takes us to the end of what we wanted to cover and we're open to, for questions for a few minutes. Yeah, I, I mean, we, we managed our own CVEs and to be able to like issue our own CVEs, you, you, you at least back a number of year ago, years ago, there weren't things like the GitHub reports or through HackerOne. So you had to, had to become your own CNA. Um, I was involved in that process quite a bit. So like when we, we'd ask for a block of 10, we'd document them somewhere and then we'd have to use them, but it was kind of a cumbersome manual process. And we actually are still registered as the CNA for Node, and if anybody issues a CV against Node that didn't come through us, I'm kind of like, well, why did you do that, right? Like, we should still be the, the authoritative answer in terms of what is and what isn't a CVE. People can, can argue, but like, in the end, that's part of being the CNA. So. Any other questions? Well, it's, it works pretty well. Uh, the only issue is uh, when we need the reporter to review a pull request. Normally we send the patch manually through, the, through the, the comment, but it's good because we can allow a specific people to a specific reports, not just uh, to, to all the reports in the Node.js we receive. So it's, it's easy to find people to help. It's easy to comment, to address issues, to, to see in which version it affects. And it's also easy to, to request CVEs and uh, manage the status of the reports. Yeah, yeah certainly that, like what, what Raphael just pointed out, the fact we can pull in individuals uh, through HackerOne, like they have to register, but like once they're registered, we can say, okay, we're giving you access to this one specific report is something we've used a lot to pull in like, you know, somebody with some special expertise that we need without having to give them access, like our node private repo, we have brought people in there too to look at, CD, at, at the fix, fixes, but we're basically letting them see everything when we do that. So the hacker one one is nice and that we can do that in a much more targeted way. Yep. So you mentioned that you locked down GI for about a week during security. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, we lock CI because uh, whenever you, uh, you create a secret batch, you need to run the CI against all the, the machines. So if you run it, uh, people that uh, don't have access to secret patches will be able to go to the CI and see what, what, what is the difference, what is the patch. So we normally lock only for uh, TSC members, releasers. So, uh, so other people, like other Node.js contributors that won't be able to create new uh, new CIs or run CIs, so that's why we lock. The difference is that sometimes we need one week because it's a bunch of packs, or sometimes we need uh, a week because this patch affects uh, a jest, for instance, that affects a good, uh, uh, well-used library like React. So we normally lock it to check, okay, this will break or this won't break, okay.
So the larger aspect of like not Node Core, Node itself, but the larger aspect of all the modules out there, there, there is a package maintenance team within the Node project. They don't really focus on the security side thing, but there they are. There's some overlap um, with uh, a collaboration space that's that's been spun up under the OpenJS Foundation, which is looking more at the secure supply chain. And they're they're actually. Um, there was a, the OSTF, I don't know if you saw one of the keynotes this morning, but they actually made a large donation and they're funding work through the OpenJS Foundation to like, for example, there's some OSSF best practices, but those aren't specific to JavaScript ecosystem. So they're actually taking those and they're transforming them into something that can be more specific for the uh, you know, JavaScript maintainers. So that group is actually thinking about like, what should we be doing on the security side of things? How can we improve the supply chain security? Um, I think it's 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 more at the early stages, but if you're interested, that's some that's a group they meet. I think it's every Monday, every two weeks. You could go and listen into what they're working on. So we, we do have Coverity running on all the builds, so we use that in terms of static analysis. Fuzzing has been discussed many times in the security team, but we've never had somebody who's actually stepped up and made it happen. So it's just one of those things that like, it's a, hey, we would, we wouldn't, we would like to do it, but we would need somebody who would invest the energy to figure out how to do it and, and how to make it effective in the project. Is it a project over the integrating the OSS Fuzz? I, no. Like that's, I, I think for some of the, like OSS fuzz, I think you can easily integrate for like NPM packages. Um, Node is like 50% or more C++. And so it's not really a JavaScript package, um, but I haven't looked at it to know whether it actually would work with the Node project or not. I do know that like it, it's been added to some other smaller packages, but uh, not to me. Yeah, so I think it's it's one of those ones nobody is like, no, we don't want to do that. It's just more like, hey, yeah, uh, we're we're open to contributions and PRs to help make that happen. Another question? I think we are out of time already. But yeah, thank yeah, you folks.